Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Hi, Christy. I recognize some wine club people. This is cool. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Hi, Julie. Deborah and Michelle here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That was wonderful. Oh, this is so great. We won't be able to get, I won't be able to get to see everybody. I'm sure, well, I'm going to try. But. Welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> Where there's always a bottle of Porque No ready to drink. Here's everyone. Excellent. So should we go ahead and get started or should we give it a couple more minutes? No, let's I, get started. Yeah. Let's get started. yeah. Um, well, my name is Hillary Schaefer and I'm from Pensacola, Florida. And we have started this collection Uncorked is a collaboration between myself and the Pensacola Museum of Art. And so we put together this uh, tasting box, which is part of what I do with Wine with Hillary. I put together tasting boxes and then um, also classes. And this is our second time doing a collaboration with the Pensacola Museum of Art. But since we were going through the pandemic, we actually um, sold the boxes retail instead of being able to do it together in the museum. So Anna Wall is here. She's the curator from Pensacola Museum of Art, and she's in front of the artwork that she'll tell us all about soon. And then we have Maggie Mazzotti, which is uh, from Trace Saboris Winery. She's the communications director with Julie Johnson, the winemaker for the Porque Known wine that we are tasting tonight. So welcome everyone. I think um, Anna will kind of talk us through the pieces of art and then Julie and I can discuss why this wine was chosen and she can tell us all about the details of the wine. Anna, can you tell us, welcome everybody, welcome to my kitchen, welcome <laughs> to Trey Saboris on the Western Rutherford bench of the Napa Valley. If those of you who have been to the Napa Valley, we are about halfway up and we're on the western side of the Napa Valley, western side of Highway 29. So even a little tighter, we're about 15 minutes north of the Oakville Grocery and about 10 minutes south of uh, Gotts or press or farmstead in, uh, in St. Helena. For me, everything about wine is about food and about the great table that you all set and the good company around it. Trace Saboris is an old, from an old song, a Latin song, Saborani, my flavor, my taste. And for me, there are, for many years, I've been, this winery has been existed. I founded this winery 20 years ago uh, this year. And uh, the three tastes, the tres sabores, the three tastes in every wine are in every glass. The vine, the terroir, the place, and the good company around the table. So I think that often I love talking about wine in terms of music, in terms of one's personal cultural experiences, in terms of food. And so today it was so delightful to see this really creative package come through from the Pensacola Museum of Art. And I'm just, I'm thrilled to be, uh, to be joining you all today. I am always the person who goes to visit a market where my distributors sell wine. And I say, is there a museum that we could meet? <laughs> can, we, can we do a tasting? Can we, can we meet? Can we have our talk uh, in some cultural space? Uh, be that in New York or in Atlanta or in San Francisco or now, I can't wait to go personally to see you, Anna, at uh, the Pensacola Museum. Can you tell us a little bit about the museum for people who are on who don't know anything about it? We want to know a little bit more about it. Of course. Thank you, Julie. Um, I, my name is Anna Wall. I'm the chief curator here at the Pensacola Museum of Art. We're located in the heart of downtown Pensacola, Florida. We are in an old jail building that was actually built in 1907 and became an art center in 1954. We've been operating continually in this space. Now we're a part of the University of West Florida. So we serve the university community and the community of Northwest Florida and the great tourist population that visits us throughout the year. 
we focus on modern and contemporary art from 1850 to the present. We have over 20 exhibitions a year in our space, and we also steward a permanent collection of about 700 works of art. Um, we don't have permanent collection galleries, so we usually have less than 5% of our collection on display at the museum. And we were thinking of ways that we could engage the community more with our collection and show them more pieces. And we dreamed up this collaboration with Hillary and had our first program in the museum galleries in January. Um, it's been a really fun process. I send Hillary a few works of art from our collection and then she pairs them with wines. At our live event, um, we were able to show the works in the galleries and Hillary and I moved around the space I explained the art, Hillary talked about the wine, and then visitors could enjoy them both together. So in our second collaboration during this pandemic, um, we took advantage of Hillary's wine boxes that she does through Wine with Hillary and did a special collection on quartz collaboration. And I never dreamed up that we would actually get to work with one of the wineries directly and hear about their process. So this is really fun for us and hopefully for you. Um, you'll learn about a few pieces from our collection tonight. Our collection is mostly works on paper. Um, we have a large collection of prints and photographs. A good number of our works are from late 19th, late 19th century Paris, like these works you'll see today. And then we have a lot of modern and contemporary artists um, from all over the globe. So I hope you'll learn more about us and visit us if you're ever in Florida. And I'm looking forward to talking to you more about art tonight. Hillary, what, what possessed you to have this wonderful idea? And, and uh, how did you choose Trace of Morris? I love this. <laughs> yeah, so um, Anna, like she said, she sends me the pieces of art first. And I am, cannot say that I know a lot about art. I certainly appreciate it and enjoy it. But um, I kind of wanted to go, to go with that and just get a feeling from each piece that she sent me first and guide the wine decisions from that. So looking at um, the La Loire Foulet, which is behind her there, the, yes, um, from Jules Chere that she sent for this collaboration. Um, when I first saw it, I mean, I just see abandonment, freedom, joy, um, confidence, and like just somebody like really living life to the fullest and not feeling sorry about it. So. Um, when I started to think about which wine would go with that, um, Julie, your wines were something that were introduced to me when I worked for Winebow and was able to sell Julie's wines in the panhandle. And so I had talked to, I've never met Julie personally until now, um, but I had talked to a lot of my customers who had had personal relationships with her. And she is someone that um, had been spoken of with this type of joie de vivre, this spirit and when I looked into the Porqué Known wine, it was, it was perfect. It was rich enough, um, yet light on its feet. It could really, it's a versatile wine, really. It's got spice, it's got a little floral components, it's got great fruit, and it feels indulgent when you drink it. And even though it's like such a great value wine, I really thought that you know, the more I looked into it, the more I felt like it was the perfect choice for this piece of art. Well, you thank you. You've just made my life so much easier. That is like the best description ever of uh, the goal of having this winery to begin with. And the goal of having what you said was so right, exuberance. So when you go into a vineyard, as I can, because the vineyard is in, this vineyard is in my front yard, basically, in Rutherford. Um, a little bit about the vineyard. Uh, the two vineyards involved with this particular wine are both um, in Napa. One is here in Rutherford, my estate vineyard for the Cabernet and the Zinfandel, and then a little bit of Petite Syrah. And then the, also the Petite Syrah and some, of the uh, and, and some of the Cabernet also come from a vineyard up in Calistoga. Both of the vineyards are particularly exuberant because they start from the base of soil health and neither of the vineyards are irrigated. So they are simply what they are. When you go into the vineyard, literally you can feel this intellectual attachment, which is all about the art and the, you know, how are you connecting these themes and these concepts and what is organic farming, which is what we do? 
What is dry farming, which what we do? What is bringing a grape to ripeness? What are the phenolic characters? And what's the acid and the pH? And how does it taste? But then there's the other sheer visceral experience of being in a vineyard. And that's what I think this art and what you're talking about, the, the sheer joy and the exuberance is a great word for this. The abandon. Why not just let your pleasure flow? Yeah, there's a hedonistic part of enjoying a glass of wine. Why not? Especially why not right now, right? Like, holy moly. We, you know, everything <laughs> I know needs, needs just a little extra bit of simple joy. I've always thought of this particular wine in, in, in part of our portfolio. We make several wines. We make an estate Zinn and the state Cabernet. Of course, we're in Rutherford. We have Cabernet. I make a Sauvignon Blanc. I make a Rosé from Petit Syrah and Zinfandel. Uh, but this particular wine, Por Que No, was born the first time we made it in 2000. And it was a little bit of a, we thought, maybe a one-off. We had, after making the Zinn and making the Cabernet, we had little bits of, of wine left over. And I'm saying out loud, like, well, what am I going to do with all of this? all these little extra bits that don't fit. But, and somebody said, hey, why don't you just put it all together and see what happens? And we went, well, why not? And then because it's a wine we called Trace of Boris, we all went, por que no? And it, that was just as simple and exuberant and as spontaneous. I guess I could also say part of the history of the winery that I love so much about your, your matching because I feel so good about that is the kind of the serendipity factor. That's kind of all what we're doing right now, but it's also kind of like you take a little step, you put a little joy into it and a little exuberance and it happens. It's like cooking something new and bringing something to the table with friends. There's quite a bit of joy in that and quite a bit of camaraderie and quite a bit of flow and dance and dash and like you said, exuberance. And so I love it. I wanted to show you all uh, first, I hope you're all drinking. That's important when we're talking about all of this. Porque no, so a great cheer to all of you for, in, in large part, getting through a lot of this. Um, we just, at Trace of Orders, we just opened up. Um, and we have masks, and we have attack dog sanitizers. We have special Govino glasses. So it's a great luxury, actually, to be drinking out of a glass tonight. But take a minute and just take in the nose of this wine that's pretty complex because it is Zinfandel Cabernet, Petite Syrah, nothing petite about Petite Syrah, and a little known grape called Petite Verdot that's often blended with Cabernet. But rarely are Cabernet Sauvignon and Petite Syrah or Cabernet Sauvignon and Zinfandel blended together. And I have to say that I think it comes together with great verve and great excitement. When I first did the vineyard for this, when I first did this wine in 2000, I thought it was just going to be a one-off, but people loved it. But anyway, in the meantime, we had to have a label, right, to sell it. So this is my friend's joke that I have lots, I use lots of forms of art. This is actually a cocktail napkin that I took down to my good friend, designer friend, and he had it embroidered, Por Que No. And we took a scan of this cocktail napkin, and that became the label, as you can see. So Por Que No is really a cocktail napkin, which you could also say is a little bit of an inducement to enjoy yourself with another glass. In other words, why wouldn't you have a glass of wine? Why wouldn't you have another glass of wine if you can do so in moderation, of course. But as I put all of these elements together, and this it, every year is now a little bit different, and 20 years later, people still want us to make this wine, so we are. We don't, this is under a thousand cases. We're a, about a 3,000 case winery. So this is a small production winery, but something that's focused. And this is our blend, our key Southern Mediterranean red blend that makes it all come together. But it is kind of, um, I like it because it's smooth. I like it because it's complex. I like it because it's very versatile. You can put this, speaking of food, you can serve this wine like a little black trash. You can serve this wine with pizza or you can serve this wine with a really wonderful steak. 
because the fruit of the Zinfandel and the Petite Syrah bring any piece of meat, especially barbecued meat, forward and make it sweeter and more savory. It handles spice really well because it's all about acid and all about natural acid and bringing forward the, I wouldn't say overripe at all. I hate raisins personally. So I, I'm inclined to make, try to make wines that are naturally inspired by a healthy soil that leads to great grapes that makes the grapes come together pretty nicely in the bottle. So that's the kind of scoop on Port Cane No, but welcoming any questions. But that's kind of a background. And I hope now that we're getting to the art tour part of our Zoom here today that you'll continue to enjoy this wine and we're certainly happy, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you have about it. But this is one of those moments I think where sometimes I sit down at a restaurant and I'm ordering a new wine that I haven't heard before and I kind of want to take it apart and analyze it. But then, you know, there are other times when you just simply order a glass of wine at the restaurant and you know the food is good, you really enjoy the wine, and you just sit back and have a good time. And in the spirit of this, let's really talk art now and look at these wonderful... The, oh, the other thing I have to say, I love the colors. The colors naturally match as well. And the colors are bright and exuberant, yet with great focus. So. Anna, can you tell us a little bit now about the art? I'm looking forward to this part. Everybody enjoy some wine now while you're taking the <laughs> gallery tour. <laughs> yes, and just hearing you describe the wine, there are several things that I think line up with the content and then the medium of these works of art. So what I've got here is the Jules Charest that inspired Hillary to choose Porqué Noël as the pairing, um, a poster that he did in 1893. And then on the other side of me, I have two works of art by an artist that you might be more familiar with, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, we have a poster that he made in 1895 of May Belfort, and then a print of Marcel Linder that was done the same year. So the Marcel Linder would have been made more for gallery sales, but these two works of art here were posters. Um, and posters around 1890s when they were made were just becoming an art form. And I think of it kind of like you're describing this new wine that you made that might not be considered the top, you know, pure grapes um, that aren't blends. These posters in the 1890s were really um, different from the kind of high um, salon style art that was being displayed in Paris, but quickly gained traction um, and send us Yacla Paris and now are considered um, to be excellent examples of graphic design and to be fine art in themselves. Um, Jules Charest and Toulouse Lautrec are both represented in museums all around the world. Um, they kind of are good opposites. Um, Jules Charest got his start in a poor family in Paris, a family of artisans. So he trained as an artist from a young age. Um, at 13, he started his training in lithography, uh, which is the medium used for this poster here. He studied in London and really learned a lot about the British style of poster making. He's a little bit older than Toulouse-Lautrec, um, and you'll see that their styles are very different. So Charest went to London, came back to Paris, um, fell in with the cabarets and cafe concerts, and started making advertisements for them. So late 19th century Paris was a whole new world. Um, in the 1850s, Baron Haussmann completely uh, redesigned Paris. Cafe culture had always been a part of life. Uh, there were lots of cafes in the early 19th century that artists and poets would frequent. Sometimes they would have small musical acts that would perform there. But after Haussmann's Paris, they started building these huge music halls, cafe concerts, they were called that were basically cabarets, cafes where you could eat, drink, and then see these musical acts, singers, performers of all different types. And by 1890, when these works were made, there were over 350 cafe concerts in Paris. This coincided with a growing uh, prosperity in Paris. People had more money to spend on leisure. So all of a sudden there were these cafe concerts, circuses, all these different leisure activities that people could enjoy. And at the same time, they did, they changed a lot of laws, making 
advertising more prolific throughout the city. Uh, there were laws protecting advertisements and posters from being torn down. They erased the restrictions on having to register as a business in order to advertise. So all of a sudden these small music halls, these small companies could advertise all around the city. And the city just transformed from kind of gray brick to being an exhibition hall of these colorful posters and advertisements all around the city. And a lot of artists started jumping on this, using it as an opportunity to get their work out and of course, to get some business and some money. Jules Charest is the master of advertisement. He's really the, the father of modern advertisement as we know it. He started out doing these kind of cabaret posters and then eventually was hired by perfume companies, cosmetic companies, wine and liquor companies, and towards the end of his life, even railroad companies and other large corporations. So he was really a businessman and kind of took off. Um, but for this earlier work of cabaret advertisement, um, you'll see here, this is his, what he's known for is this woman kicking up her heels, um, very exuberant, joyful, colorful. You can see um, she's showing her feet and her legs and very scandalous. Um, this is actually Loa Fuller, who was an American dancer who moved to Paris and she was famous for her serpentine dances. So she pioneered using gels on lights in the theater and she would wear these swirling white dresses and swirl around looking like some kind of alien creature and the lights would change colors and her dress would change colors as she danced and Paris was just obsessed with it. She had a year-long residency. She danced every single night for a year at the Folie Bergère and that's what this is advertising. And it's interesting, you'll see a difference with how Toulouse-Lautrec portrays the cabaret dancers. Um, Charest really idealizes them. Uh, Loire was actually uh, known for being kind of frumpy off stage, short, and then she would just come to life when she was dancing. But she certainly wouldn't have shown her legs and her feet like this. She had more of a modern, I mean, sorry, modest costuming. Um, but Charest has really changed her to advertise her and promote the show. These women show up throughout all of his advertisements. They're actually called charrettes. They were so popular on the streets. Um, and that people have called Charest the father of women's liberation because he really captured this moment when women were allowed to go out in Paris. They could visit the concert. They could have a more active role in society and they could also kind of rise to prominence as these dancers and performers in Parisian society in a way that they couldn't before. Um, and if you look more into his work, you'll see the same kind of women depicted uh, throughout his career. And then you have someone like Toulouse Lautrec who really wanted to capture the, an honest portrayal of the underworld of Paris. Um, his women are more realistic, more naturalistic. Um, they're advertisements in the same way as Charest, but they lack kind of the stylization the idealization that you think about when selling a product. So here we've got Toulouse Lautrec's poster for May Belfort. May actually commissioned Lautrec to do this poster. Um, it was used as advertisements for her performance at cabarets throughout Paris and then picked up by dealers in Paris and made as prints to sell in their galleries. She's shown here in her standard costume for her performance. So she would always dress kind of childlike, like a little girl, a baby in this dress with this puff sleeves, this ruffled bonnet. And her most famous number was she would sing a song called Daddy Wouldn't Buy Me a Bow Wow. And she'd hold this live black cat in her arms while she performed. And she had a very deadpan. She'd stand just still in the center of the stage, holding this cat, singing this um, ridiculous song. And people loved it. Toulouse Lautrec uh, illustrated her several times throughout his career. But you'll see it's very different from the charade. There's a flattened composition that is influenced by Japanese prints at the time that were circulating throughout Paris. It looks very simplistic, but actually it's pretty hard to make. He used four different stones to create this lithograph. Um, 
And just the way that he presents her kind of like an icon of the Paris underworld with her attributes, with her cat and her costume. Everyone would have recognized this as Mae Belfort. And I think that the performers really respected Latrec for showing them as they were. They also were very friendly with Latrec. I don't know if you know his history. Um, unlike Charay, Luce Latrec was born into an aristocratic family. Um, his father was a count, but due to years of inbreeding, he had a lot of physical ailments that prevented him from doing what a proper count should do. And as a young boy, he got really into art um, since he couldn't run and play with the other boys. And upon moving to Paris, he started studying with Bonaire in Montmartre and discovered this whole underworld of performers um, at places like the Moulin Rouge and this kind of alternative lifestyle really spoke to him. And he found his band of misfits that he loved and portrayed in his artwork. So this woman right here, Marcel Linder, she's another cabaret performer. She was best known for her dances. This is her in her costume that she would do um, when she performed the bolero as part of an operetta that played at different cafes around the city. You'll see she's got her signature bright red hair. Uh, she would always wear red poppies in her hair, which you can see they puff up kind of like pom-poms. So this work shows how quickly posters became part of the Parisian art world. This work wouldn't necessarily have been shown as an advertisement. As galleries um, and artists themselves began to recognize how popular their posters were, they started to commercialize them um, and commodify them within the art market. So gallerists and artists themselves would make prints and sell them within the galleries. And that's why we have some that we can acquire today that are so well um, preserved. These wouldn't necessarily have been on the walls of the Cafe Concert in Paris. They would have been sold by galleries, preserved by collectors. And this, with its size, the framing of the border would have been more of a print that someone would have collected. And Chere, in particular, being the businessman that he was, really jumped on this opportunity. He worked with a lot of artists in Paris to get their work reproduced. He um, published a very well-known volume of prints by over 70 artists in Paris that was really popular. Um, so he worked really hard to make lithography, printmaking, and posters a true art form. And he just continues to grow in prominence, I think, in the art world and become, becoming more well-known. And it's part of the work that he did when he was actually a working artist in Paris. So that's a bit of an introduction. Great. That's great. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Maggie is going to field some of these questions for us. Anybody can raise your hand. I could add something. This is my husband, John. <laughs> Hi. I don't know if uh, in this conversation about art and wine that Julie might have made this point, but I think it's an interesting one that in terms of the grapes that are actually growing here on the property, that the art of the wine is that you don't really start with the media and then put it on whatever canvas. You're literally creating or making or growing the media that you're then going to put on the canvas. So it really is a whole kind of other layer. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You're did, not, I get, did I get that right? Well, you, <laughs> you know, you only have so much control over your media. You're not, you know, the mixing, for me, the mixing of all the colors or the mixing all the, of all the palette comes from just having different grapes to work with. We're not, I'm not a winemaker that manipulates a, a great deal. I love the idea that for the Jules Charest that, that she was, that she was photographed or that she was painted, that the lithograph was drawn kind of to reflect all the different lights that showed on her costume. So it was very, it's a very dynamic, it seems very dynamic. And the best wines are dynamic as well, I'd say. I don't know. Well, I think it's interesting too, especially with a blend like this, that was kind of an experiment 
not knowing how it's going to turn out. And then you think about the spontaneity and the trial and error process of art too. You have this finished product that you think uh, just happened, but the number of variations that would have had to go into um, creating a work like this, the number of trials with the stones, making sure you get the colors right. Um, and also with printmaking, each edition is slightly different um, depending on how many times the stone has been used, um, if they use different colors, the way the colors blend. Um, so I see a parallel with winemaking in that way. Well, we, we make all of our, unlike a lot of larger places, all of my wines, all of my red wines are made in small three quarter ton bins. So each of these bins has only, holds only about two and a half uh, barrels of wine. Um, so really only about 70 cases of wine. So we're making them in very small batches. Some are natural ferments, some cabs, some zin, some porte no, some petit sirah, some petit verdot. And in the end, we assemble essentially about 20 of these bins to make the porte no. Some work, some don't. We go through a lot of tastings to try to compose that picture. It's a picture in your glass, though. It wants, it wants to fill your palate. For us, the hallmark of the porque no is that it does fill your palate. And it is smooth. It's easy to enjoy. But it is also something that is a blend. You know, I worked for many years at my first winery, Frog's Leap, and it was all about looking at one variety from several different vineyards. In this particular wine, it's different because it's four varieties from just two different vineyards in a multiple. It's like I have a whole palette in front of me when I start the blending process. So kind of fun that way, I think. There is definitely a parallel to that. And then it's the kind of like, ah, I think we'll put in just a little bit more Zinfandel this year because I love that fresh dance. For me, I, I make a very serious, lovely, but very serious Zinfandel that I always have called my jazz club. The Port I know, I've always talked about it in terms of dance. Now, you're changing my, you're, you're, I've always gone with Port Cano as salsa dancing, but you're definitely... <laughs> You're definitely changing and opening up my perspective a little bit more to the Folies Berger. You know, it's it's great fun, but it still involves performance art, right? It's still yes. it's still portraying the art of art making, printmaking is performance art. The art of winemaking is that as well. And then you have the artist herself doing this wonderful thing. So mm -hmm. great that and, and how long does it take for something like this from when you dream up mixing? all of those leftover wines <laughs> to get to the finished product. Well, at this point, the Porque, many years later now, the original Porque, a couple of vintages of Porque Nose were just simply everything we did have left over. Now we actually source specific parts of each of the vineyards and look at the wines. We don't, they tend to be the barrels because they're aged in barrel. It's a two year process. So they're aged in barrel for a couple of years and the barrels in, in general for Port Cano are not the newest oak barrels. I only use about 30% new oak in my wines anyway, but these tend to be the barrels that have been uh, previously inspired. So we're not looking for just bold mm, oaky flavors or tastes. We're really looking for the wines themselves, the varieties themselves to harmonize and to to take it to the art again, a colorful array on your palette. And again, not being too serious. This is art that's very serious in how it's composed, but the subject is not, it's not all that serious. You know, you're not sitting down in plein air, you know, painting something with an easel and, and this is all very, um, very spontaneous and has that, hey, I could just, it's not, you can't just toss it off. Like you said, with the printmaking is very, especially with the Toulouse-Lautrec, you saw, that was interesting. You said it took, you know, it's four different plates to make this happen. That's, that's really intricate work, but um, it's not quite so intricate with wine. The grapes are there, they taste really good. I pick them, I make the best I can, letting them show their own personality. And then I put them together and it makes poor came out. 
Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so it's been really fun working with Hillary on this project. And for the the first event we did in January, she said it was the first time that she'd ever paired wine with art. She's done food pairings before. And I was really interested to see what she would come up with because you can go, um, you know, kind of with basic pairing and think, oh, Jules Charest is French. I'll pair it with a French wine. Um, you can pair it based on kind of the, the label or the style. And so it's been really fun to see what she has come up with. And I don't know, Hillary, if you could talk a little bit more about the difference between a food pairing and an art pairing and how, how you did the process. Yeah, honestly, and I, I would say that there's more similarity in it than difference. And I do like to trust my intuition a lot when it comes to either one. And then you have parallels and you have um, contrasts when you're doing food or wine pairing. And I mean, this one just really, it just paralleled everything. I, I think I can share a picture. Uh, let me try really quick because I would love to show everyone what the bottle and the piece look like um, from our print and in the box. Um, But it's, it's fun because it becomes something even more than what we expect and bringing Julie in and getting to discuss it all together when she was talking about, well, I always thought it was salsa, but uh, now you're really convincing me that it has <laughs> almost more applications. I thought, well, why not? Why can't 4K No do more than one dance? And it's fun just hearing you guys talk and hearing the more and more similarities and justifying the choice in the beginning. Well, maybe, uh, maybe you'll let me come in person. Maybe we can try another pairing. What do you say? Yeah. Could I come in person? Kind of, nothing like inviting myself, but I would love to, um, I'd love to meet both of you in person, of course. And uh, maybe we'll do, maybe we can try another wine sort of spontaneously. And uh, isn't there a fit, you know, I don't know. There are a lot of famous women printmakers as well. That might be mm -hmm. kind of fun, right? Yeah. And we have some great women artists in our collection. And, you know, we've never done it the reverse where uh, we start with a bottle of wine and try to pair a work of art with it. So that could be a fun, a fun challenge as well. Really get Hillary in our vaults and see what, are some see of, what we what have. Are, who, who are some of the women printmakers that you might have in your collection? Well, let's see. Well, we so a little bit more history about us. Um, when we were founded in 1954, we were founded by a group of women locally that wanted to have an exhibition space in Pensacola. Um, so we are a woman founded museum and that's to us an important part of our history and our collecting focus. So we have a lot of works by um, women who were involved in the museum from the beginning. Um, and then on a larger scale, we in past years acquired a large scale work by Katrina Andre, who's an artist working out of New Orleans. We just recently collected another New Orleans artist, um, Josephine Sacabo, who does photogravures, which are really beautiful um, photographs inspired by poetry. And then we have um, works by Clementine Hunter, who's not a printmaker, but she's a painter, also another um, Southern woman artist. Um, so lots of women that have been working kind of regionally. Nice, nice. Well, it's been, it's been, um, does anybody have any questions or anything else for us? We did, we promised, oh, there's one. Becky, do you have a question? Maggie, can you unmute her? She can, uh, Becky, you can unmute yourself. And. Becky, un if you can hear me, unmute yourself. There you go. I did. Okay, great. I wanted to first say thank you to you for doing this. I live in Houston, and we can never make it to any of the wonderful little events that you have, so I was thrilled to be able to have this. I hope you guys do it again, you know, in some way. Um, so thank you very much. And, uh, and I wanted to ask Anna, um, these beautiful prints that you have up there, do you guys have reproductions for sale from your... Um, art from your gallery? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. We don't have them right now, um, but that would be a good thing to add to our shop. 
these are all fairly recent acquisitions um, that we were able to purchase in the past couple of years. Um, the charade, actually, you guys are the first people to see it. Uh, it's really been in our vault, so it's the first time it's out for the public. Um, we haven't even really framed it up like we should. <laughs> you guys are really seeing it uh, for the first time and in its raw form. Um, but these are, particularly the May Belfort and the Loire Fuller are some of these artists' more famous works. So you could probably find them online, reproduce as posters for sale. And it's interesting, I think both Charest and toulouse lautrec would love that their works are still reproduced so often. And toulouse lautrec who you might remember from the film Moulin Rouge and has kind of entered more of our pop culture more than Charest might have so far. Um, I think he would love the place that he has in our visual culture right now. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. It has been so much fun. I've heard a lot, and uh, I appreciated this so much. Hillary, you're inspired. I love you. I want to meet you and drink with you. <laughs> and uh, Anna, likewise, thank you so much for sharing all of your things. Yeah, well, it's that's a pleasure. That's the easy part of it. So I want to thank my entire team and uh, the members of both the museum and also wine club members of Trace of Boris and invite any and all of you to be in touch with us directly. You can find us on the web and I look forward, like I say, to visiting you all in Pensacola again really soon. Can't wait to get out of Napa. <laughs> so <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. you all. Maggie, I think you'll, I think you'll end this and uh, Please don't hesitate to be in touch with us, uh, any of us, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see all of you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Ellen.